It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. The way we find jobs today is so different than in the past. I was laughing because somebody was uh, talking to me about this, that I had a whole section on how to find a job in my first book. I've done 10, but in my first book, that was uh, one published over 30 years ago. There was no internet. And it was so funny as they were relating what I said about looking for a job. I mean, it's nothing at all about how it's done today. The only thing that is the same today as it was 30 plus years ago is that people hire people. And that most jobs, even in this digital era, that the people who are hired tend to be people that were wired for that job, meaning a wired job is where a company, an organization pretends they're going through a job screening process, but they already knew who they were going to hire or who they thought they were going to hire before they even started the process. And so that has not changed. Jobs are still found through networking, through people you know and people who know of you. And that's how it works. And that's why what's going on right now is so important for you to be aware of as we're moving into a slower economy and more people are going to be laid off, unfortunately, than have been in recent years as the Federal Reserve tries to engineer an economic slowdown to squeeze inflation out of the economy means you got to be more in your guard in the job market. I'm going to tell you what you got to be most wary of, what usually is coined ghost jobs. Um, also, later, I'm going to address an old question. Can money buy happiness? Is that called existentialism? Is that what I'm doing, Chris? What is existentialism? Come on, Krista, help Why me. Why do you do this to me? Well, because oh all my these, gosh. I mean, all I know these I concepts I have so much trouble with. I mean, I remember I studied existentialism, and I thought it was like worrying about the bigger like bigger questions in life, but I will look up the exact But wouldn't that be an existential question? Does money buy happiness? Oh, my gosh. It's a, physical, it's a philo philosophical theory or approach which emphasizes the existence of a the individual person as a free and responsible agent determining their own development through acts of the will. I guess that's not. Yeah. Excellent. Let's just talk about if money buys happiness. Does money buy happiness? That's what we'll be talking about later. <laughs> you're killing me and lately. Thank you. Well, no, I love, I mean, you're so much smarter than I am. That's absolutely not true. That is true. And so um, I, I throw questions like that to you because you are, well, that was so much more an intellect than no, I am. No way. And the Google told me that because I couldn't remember. The Google? The Google. You know, the one you got to avoid is Dr. Dr. Google. Dr. Google, yeah. Dr. Yeah, Google can see Yeah, because everybody's you. three clicks from cancer on Dr. Google. For sure. Oh, I, I, I sneezed today. Oh, yeah. You probably have blah, blah, blah cancer. If you're going to read medical stuff, this is so off topic. If you're going to read medical stuff, read medical journals actually respected medical journals that are written to the medical industry, but avoid UFO medical information because it's even more dangerous for you than all the political stuff flying around. And I think you can also look at, if you're wondering about a specific thing, um, the Mayo Clinic has a really thorough site and there's some other respected um, medical like facilities and research places that do have a lot of information out there. So how did you get your first job out of college? My first job, um, I went actually became a temp when I first moved to a new city. I got a t I went to a temp agency, gave them my resume and worked a bunch of different jobs for them. But I also had like three jobs at the same time. But it was, you know, traditionally you'd send out your resume in the mail with a note and a thank you note later. Handwritten notes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's amazing for someone who's come of age in the era of the internet 
the job thing is so different now. And you post on these job sites and you look at electronic job, uh, for lack of a better term, bulletin boards. And we're moving into an economic cycle that's something that I talked about so much 15 years ago to like 10 years ago, the ghost jobs, fake job listings. Now, sometimes fake job listings will be from legitimate organizations that they're just trying to prospect, find uh, good potential people out there for the future, and they'll just make up something so they have uh, electronic resumes on file. But most of the time, it's not benign like that. It's actually crooks posting too good to be true jobs where they're trying to scam you. It can either be something where it's a get rich quick opportunity or it can be out and out identity theft. And more of us are out of practice having to scrounge for a job because we've been through an era of extremely low unemployment for the last eight years. And even now, as the Federal Reserve has been trying to slow down hiring activity, what a weird concept. What a weird concept. Trying to slow down the job market to reduce the bargaining power you and I have to get raises, to make us feel more insecure about employment so that inflation can be driven out of the economy. Weird, right? But it has real-life consequences. And there will be people who will be laid off and will be out looking for new jobs in numbers larger than we've seen in a long time, other than that weird blip from the COVID back in March of 20. Why do I call it the COVID instead of COVID? Whatever. Um, the point is that if you are finding yourself suddenly unemployed and you're desperately looking for a new job, please be very, very cautious and careful when you give personal information, if you give personal information, and background, whatever the supposed organization is. I mean, there are so many tip-offs with companies that you can't find anything about them online. Uh, there are listings that will say, fast-growing, ground-floor opportunity. Boy, that's a tip-off that something bad is going to happen to your wallet. Be very, very wary Skeptical, not cynical. You'll hear me say that a lot as the economy slows. Be a skeptic, not a cynic. Because we are moving into a time that people are going to be a little more on edge financially and a little more desperate financially. And that leaves you vulnerable to people that would take advantage of you. And that's clearly coming in the job market. If anything, I'm trying to plant a seed in your head that if you or a family member or friend loses his or her job, that the warning sticks with you to be really, really careful with the job hunt because of all the ghost jobs that are going to be posted. Jobs that are either not legit or don't actually exist. Krista? Jim is in Wisconsin, says, I recently was informed of a new way to make some side cash, donating my plasma. In my city, this can get you up to $800 for your first month. Wow. However, when you sign up, they want proof of your social security number. I know how you feel about giving this to medical facilities. How do you feel about giving it out here? I think they probably report your income to the IRS. Wow. Just answered the question for me. Um, it is uh, income coming to you. It has to be reported. And that's why they've got to have a valid social security number. And that would be what's known as a legitimate business purpose for having the social security number. And I appreciate that you have registered in your brain to be extra careful 
any time a medical office asks for your social security number. I went to a new doctor just recently, not once, not twice, but three times on the initial forms for that doctor, it asked for social security number. And I left it blank all three times. Bo in Florida says, my 15-year-old son was driving to school with my wife on a four-lane highway, and another car going the opposite way ran a flashing arrow and turned directly into their path. Oh. Our Volvo had pretty major front da- damage, and the other driver had damage on the passenger side and minor injuries. I'm glad that everybody uh, was okay. It was just minor injuries for the at-fault driver. For sure. The other driver was cited by the police for violation of right-of-way, and her insurance company said that we were 20% at fault and would only accept 80% responsibility. We then reported to our insurance, who went into arbitration with the other insurance company and found us 10% at fault and their driver 90%. Our car repairs were $30,000, and this was taken care of, but the other, but our insurance company said we had to go over after the other one to pay our $2,000 car rental as we didn't have rental replacement on our policy. The insurance company said they paid out the maximum on their customer's policy, so we were on our own for the $2,000 car rental. Should we try to appeal this with either of these major insurance companies or chalk this up as an expensive lesson to have the car rental coverage on our policy, which I have since added? Bo, all right, so Bo, the individual who caused this accident, first I want to go back before we talk about the rental car, I want to go back to this whole subrogation thing. So auto insurers have become really uh, adept at finding the non-at-fault party in some way partially at fault because this makes both insurance companies more money. Because now both drivers have an at-fault claim on their insurance. The 10%, I mean, what garbage? 90-10? Really? That's just silliness. So what happens when an insurer won't take full responsibility and you go to your insurance and the other party goes to their insurance is you end up in this uh, system that is, as I recall, is in all 50 states. Insurance is regulated by the states and it's called subrogation. It's these industry internal agreements where they decide among themselves, okay, we're allocating 70-30 or 50-50 or whatever. It's almost never that subrogation will find 100-0. So they're winking and nodding and finding each party at least some percent responsible so everybody who's an insured loses. So you don't want to go to your own insurer on a claim. You want to only go to the responsible party the person who took the illegal left turn. Once you involve your own insurer, you're going to end up in a circumstance like this through subrogation that no matter what, you could be sitting still and somebody runs into you, they're still going to find you 10% liable through subrogation. What can you do about the $2,000? If the individual who made the illegal left is employed, at a traditional job, not self-employed or whatever, you can sue the individual in small claims court for the $2,000. If you, in fact, win a judgment, that doesn't mean they're just going to write you a check in court, but you'd have the ability with that judgment to go after their wages to recover the $2,000. The problem across the 50 states, there may be a few exceptions, is that the state required minimums for insurance are never enough to cover the consequences of even a relatively minor accident. In this case, it was past minor if someone was injured. Um, And that's how you would recover the $2,000. It doesn't mean that individual is absolved from the consequences of the cost, but it means that their insurer washes their hands of it because of the amount they've already paid out is the policy coverage that's available that's a lot to say yes and i do have a quick follow-up question so when is it appropriate to subrogate 
because they their their insurance company was able to get it down to ten percent from twenty percent. Or if someone you're being mistreated, yeah. you just go straight to the insurance commissioner in that state. You could file a complaint with the insurance commissioner. Uh, you could you could sue the individual involved again, depending on the amount in small claims court. You want to in all circumstances that it's practical. You want to avoid the subrogation process because the insurer is not representing you really. Technically, they are, but they're trying to cut the best deal for them. And believe it or not, taking 10% responsibility ultimately benefits them because then they can surcharge you for several years to come. And that's why you want to avoid ending up in subrogation, if at all possible. Okay. And Shalina in Texas says, I recently installed solar roofing. I've been very happy with it so far. I'd like to install an energy backup system. Who did system. they buy it from? GAF. GAF is a huge player in, uh, in roofing shingles. That's interesting because that's the first person we've had. That's a newer product for GAF. Tesla's been talking about solar roofs for, what, 10 years? And I think they've installed 12 across America or something. So it's great that GAF is doing this. I'd like to install an energy backup system. Do you recommend a generator or solar batteries? If it makes a difference, the generator I'm considering is a Generac with 22 to 26 kilowatts. The only two solar battery backups that are compatible with my roof are the Tesla Powerwall and the, I'm not sure how to say it, Sonnen Eco. I would I appreciate your recommendations. So this one is not going to have an automatic answer. This one's tough. Because the uh, battery wall is going to be cheaper than putting in the generator, probably. Uh, but the amount of power it may provide you and the length of time it may provide you power may be less than the generator. If it's natural gas generator, is just going to run and run and run till the power outage is over. So as a long-term play... I think you're better off with the battery walls. They're going to get cheaper over time, and you can even add to it later. And there are all kinds of advantages to the battery wall because in a situation where, you know, the solar is producing power during the day, the battery wall can provide you power once the sun goes down and help you with your bills day in and day out and be there for backup when there is an outage. The advantage of the generator, obviously, you have one of these, Krista. Mm -hmm. It's been great when there have been storms, mm -hmm. right? It just runs and runs and runs, and then you got that bill for the natural gas. But it means that you have uninterrupted power. Um, if you put in the power walls, you're going to have to select what things in your home probably are the most important to be running during an outage uh, from the power company, but my preference is for the power walls. And again, it's not a slam dunk case. I want to go to this one that people have argued about for a long, for centuries. Does money buy happiness? Well, a lot of intellectuals, philosophers, and even studies disagree on this i'm going to give you my two cents bad pun straight ahead a lot of people think that if they won the lottery the powerball the big gamey thing whatever and they daydream about winning this big big lottery prize that all their troubles are going to be over and their life is going to just be perfect moving forward and it's a common refrain whenever the powerball or i think it is powerball and big game i think that's what the two big multi yeah, the one mega millions called. mega millions mega millions i don't know i don't know what you buy these tickets I, don't, I haven't bought one of these tickets in years oh really i used to get in pool at work for like a dollar but yeah can you imagine the fight later? You didn't pay your share. <laughs> You're not getting any of the zillion dollars. Anyway, uh, every time one of these jackpots gets to be huge, 
uh, it's standard operating procedure that every local television station in America is out there asking people who are in line to buy the tickets as the frenzy gets larger and larger and the lottery pool tops a billion dollars or whatever. You know, what would you do with the money? And you hear people's stories, what they do with the money. And they're kind of daydreaming, looking off into space while they answer. And there's this thought that money conquers all and solves all. So there have been many studies that have found that there are diminishing returns. Yes, there's great value in having enough money to meet life's necessities to create a baseline of happiness that when you have no more worries about where's the money going to come for the rent, being able to afford the food, pay for life's necessities, that that creates a baseline of happiness. But someone who starts getting into more and more money, does that make them happier? I'm not sure. There's a lot of disagreement in surveys. You know, for a long time, inflation adjusted was said that about 75000 a year was the point at which people would not be happier above that. Now, new studies say, no, no, no. It's more like you get to a certain level, and after that, the benefit of additional income trails off. And I support that. I can tell you, I um, have lived in an area that has been going through gentrification. And what's funny is as the neighborhood turns over, people aren't as friendly as they were when the neighborhood was not as fancy. I mean, it's weird and it's anecdotal to say this, but I've really felt this that that uh, that people are not as joyous and happy necessarily as the number of zeros of wealth added to their income have gone up in my experience interacting with people. And that's just, I mean, that, there's no science to what I just said at all. But I believe that money should not be the end-all, be-all. Having enough to get by in life plus a little more seems to be the maximum, if you will excuse the expression, bang for the buck for happiness. But once you start getting into higher and higher and higher incomes, it does not necessarily make you a happier person. And when I think about people who have made a lot of money, have a lot of money, get a lot of money, and they decide they're bagging work, that a lot of times they just can't get out of their own way. There's just like no, no joy in simple pleasures in everyday life because they don't have a goal anymore. They don't have a purpose. They don't have their thing anymore. So... I think about those people who are daydreaming of winning the lottery and never having to go to work again. There's a distinction there with a really important difference. When you reach a point financially that you don't have to and instead you want to, that to me is the key thing that unlocks more potential in life. And that's why I've talked about through the years what became a coin phrase, financial independence. But there was something else that went with it that was really hot for about five or six years. They added two other things to it. Fire. Financial independence, retire early. Retiring early for what? And what purpose? Is it so you can then do other things you want to do or do work that you enjoy? Yeah, but just... Being out there doing, oh, well, I'm going to go sail today. I'm going to 
go play golf. You'd be amazed how often that becomes rudderless and the joy isn't there anymore. I mean, the greatest joy, I hear you talk about it, Krista, all the charitable things you're involved in, in addition to raising your kids and living your life with your pets and your husband. How many animals do you have these days in your house? We like to have four, two cats and two dogs, it seems. Oh, so. Man. And, That's a lot. Yeah, and you get so much joy out of all the, the habitat homes you're building and all of the things. You, you do a million things. I, I think I think that that it's what you do with the freedom you get in your life that ultimately leads to even more happiness. But money alone is a target, a goal, and an end is an end line, end thing, end goal doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I think also certainly it depends on where you're living, right? And how much, so putting a number on it is tough. And then the idea that like, there's that, like you want to keep attaining more and more and more of the keeping up with the Joneses stuff. And if you're doing that, you never find that happiness because you're always looking for the next thing, you know? And I've been guilty of that in my life too. And I found now like just more simplicity and experiences are what matter to me too, more than anything. So where you spend your money. What you, you know? just said though, a minute ago about uh, the cost of living where you moved to. I was talking to a friend who is moving from a low cost area to the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay area. Wow. And he was talking to me yesterday about how they're getting outbid on these very simple, small, older homes and that the figures are all seven figures to buy a home that in most of the country would maybe be, uh, you know, 200000 you know, half of what the median home price is in the United States. I mean, that is a factor. I mean, you move to an ultra high cost housing market and life is tougher. For sure. All right, we'll go to questions. Michael in California says, in an article about owner's title insurance, Clark mentioned that owner's title insurance only covers past events and offers no protection against future claims. We hear more and more about crooks changing the names on titles to become a new owner. How can we protect ourselves against future claims against our property by these kinds of events? Yeah, this is a great question. And Michael, this is a failure of the local governments all over the country that more and more are addressing that there needs to be, as many counties have now done, a title registry system where you are recorded as owner, you have on file with the county your current contact information, and they notify you anytime there's any action against the title of your home. It's almost like a monitoring system for your home ownership. Now, even though there have been these spectacular and ghastly incidents with criminals figuring out how to exploit title on a property and attempt to steal ownership or um, do a borrowing against that title, it's fortunately a very rare crime, usually happens against a vacant home. It'll happen most often when, let's say, someone has gone to a assisted living and the home is now empty and sitting there. Older individual homes likely own free and clear. That's what criminals are attacking. There's been a lot of um, advertising promoting um, services that will notify you whenever there's an action against the title on your property. And those are pretty expensive ongoing subscription services. Generally, this is a rare enough crime. I don't recommend it. But the big thing is the counties need to get on this and provide, if they're not yet in the county where you are living, you need to keep talking to the county about setting up a title registry system. Okay, and this is from Christopher in Washington. For the last 16 years, I've ha had only the Chase Freedom Card, and I just recently switched it to the Unlimited for the 1.5% benefit. I also opened a Chase Sapphire Preferred in the hopes I could and would travel more with my wife as our career stabilized. After reading an article about banks shutting down credit cards and debit cards unexpectedly and your podcast on the same topic, I've been considering diversifying my credit cards with a non-Chase card. 
My wife and I both have 800 plus point credit scores and primarily bank through Schwab, but I don't want to use my Schwab debit card. I was thinking about the Capital One Venture. Do you think this would be a good move? Okay, so a couple of things here. Schwab offers a reasonably good American Express card that uh, they're doing as a tie-in with your Schwab relationship, your Schwab accounts. And that would be an alternative. You'd have the Chase card, and then you'd have an American Express card. You, it's my Noah's Ark rule. You always want to have at least two different credit cards from two different issuers because if Chase decides they don't want you anymore and they close both of your accounts, all in the same day, you got no credit anymore. Um, you mentioned the Venture card. The, uh, the Capital One Venture card is a very highly rated card that is like a travel light card. If you're at a point in your life you want to travel uh, three or more times a year, I would recommend that you open up the wallet and uh, you're going to have to swallow hard on this, pay $395 a year for the Capital One Venture X. Reason I say that one is it has far better benefits than you get with the Venture and you get $300 worth of the $395 back in free travel if you book through their travel portal for airlines, hotels, other stuff. So it nets out the same annual fee as you'd have with the Venture, but comes with a whole host of wonderful benefits netting out, again, at the 95 bucks. So I would look at that one if travel is a meaningful part of what you'd like to do. Greg in Kentucky says, Clark, you mentioned that the government and treasury money market funds are safe, but what about a prime fund? And they mentioned one that includes corporations and financial institutions. The rate is higher, so I assume more risk is involved. So the prime money funds are the only ones that had liquidity issues back during the uh, banking scandals and the Great Recession that followed 15 years ago. And the prime money funds are, uh, they have had to meet a number of new regulations that were adopted after the liquidity problems that the prime money market funds had uh, back during the financial crisis, the Great Recession, the banking scandals. So they are uh, generally what you'd call safe they are not as safe a place to put your money as in a treasury or government money market fund. So if you, you goose your yield a little bit going in the prime money market, I don't do it myself. When I have money in money market funds, I usually use a treasury money market fund, but a government money market fund that will get you a little better return than a treasury is absolutely fine. If you're not familiar with the difference, a treasury fund is the uh, obligations directly to the U.S. Treasury. A government fund will be other government types of obligations in addition to or instead of federal government obligations, instead of U.S. Treasuries. And those are both a safer choice at lower return on your money than you'd have in the prime fund. So it is your choice. Just know you're taking, going a little further out on the risk meter in a prime money market fund. And that's it for this episode. I hope that the rest of your day is absolutely fantastic. And I hope something you've heard today is something that will help you protect your wallet or grow it. And all of a sudden, like, one of my ears is super stuffed up. It's hard to hear myself. <laughs>